Yes, a huge edition of EFL TV. Anzac Day this Thursday. Certainly looking forward to it. One man who's certainly looking forward to it. More than anyone else, we didn't have any Anzac Day footy in the EFL last year. We've got four games this year. Frosty, looking forward to uh, Thursday. Four big games. Oh, it's going to be a fantastic day and a great way to celebrate Anzac Day with some EFL footy. Played at its best. A fantastic day, way to kick off the, the holiday and celebrate the Anzac tradition. Four games of EFL footy. Yeah, let's uh, have a look at those four games of football because we won't be previewing those four games in the Friday preview, so we thought we'd give this a bit of an EFL TV exclusive. Let's go Blackburn and East Burwood. Blackburn pulled out an amazing win, arguably one of their best wins in the past couple of years, and they come up against the Rams. They did. They Last week, they defeated Noble Park by five points. That was a fantastic win. Not many people gave them much of a cho- uh, hope in that game, but they really proved that perhaps they have improved this year under Peter Banfield, and they're going to be so much a better side. And you can't take them lightly. And East Burwood, they haven't started off too well. So they're zipping two after two games. I reckon Blackburn might get the job done in that battle for b- battle of Blackburn Road, I think they're calling it. <laughs> uh, ben Fraser coming back last week, kicked five goals. Well, he's back this season, making a huge difference. Burners for mine as well. Let's go down to Division 3. Mitchum and the Glen Waverley Hawks. Glen Waverley Hawks hosting this one at Central Reserve. Glen Waverley Hawks got a bit of a, a pantsing last week, whereas Mitchum, probably their first big test for the season. It is. Mitchum probably had a little bit of a soft start, but you can only beat the teams you come up against. So you don't really hold that against them. They've had good wins against the Whitehorse Pioneers and last week against Heath, or the in round one against Heathmont. So, I mean, they've done the job that they've needed to do. They've got the points. This week, though, a bit of a different test. They've got the Glen Waverley Hawks at their new home ground there at Central Reserve. The Hawks, they were very disappointing last week. They got absolutely pants by Doncaster out, at, at Doncaster Reserve, at Shrams Reserve there. And they'll be looking to bounce back. It's really going to be a real test for both clubs and really get a measure on where they sit come the end of the season. I quite like the Glen Waverley Hawks to bounce back, though, in this one. Yeah, it will be interesting uh, for Mitchum to see how they go. I think the Tigers for mine, but we'll watch this game with plenty of interest. Let's have a look at this, the Twilight game for us. We've got a Twilight game out there at Heights Reserve. Moorabark hosting the Waverley Blues. Should be a great occasion, great crowd. The first time the lights have been used at Heights Reserve. Moorabark will certainly be wanting to uh, make a bit of an amends for last week because it was a pretty ordinary performance. Yeah, they've stuck with Montrose for a half a footy. They really faded out, though, in that second half, and they were beaten by in excess of 15 goals. So they'll be really, really disappointed with that. Round one, they did what they needed to do against a Croydon side. They beat them by 11 points. So that was a really credible win. They need to win this week, though, to get their season back on track. They're coming up against Brett Davidson's Waverley Blues, who have been very disappointing for mine. They're none and two. There's two games they probably should have really fancied their chances in. Round one, a really bad defeat at the end of Harper Ferntree Gully. Last week, they went down to the other Blues, the Croydon Blues. So they'll be looking to try and bounce back. They're going to have their job cut out because I reckon the Mustangs might be on a bit of a rampage out there under the twilight conditions at Heights Reserve. Could get a little bit ugly uh, there. I think the Moorabark will bounce back as well. And then finally, the big radio game, Frosty, with one of your favourite teams, Doncaster East, going up against Don Vale. It will be on 98.1 FM from 1 till 5 and streaming from 2 to 5 here on EFL.org.au. Two teams who will be pretty confident going into this game after great wins last weekend. This is the real eight-point game. You've got two teams that have both had a win and a loss to start off their season. Doncaster East were very disappointing in round one. They bounced back last week. Donvale, on the other hand, they've done the same thing. They lost in round one. They defeated Bayswater last weekend as well. So both teams are coming into the game with a little bit of momentum. It's really going to set one of the teams up and put the other on the back foot. Donvale for mine. Well, Doncaster East for mine. Just a little bit of heart, not head going there. All the other games on Saturday for this week's... uh EFL matches will be previewed in the Friday preview. So check it that out Friday afternoon at EFL.org.au. I love the work that Norwood's done over the, the summer and their recruiting. I rate their, their list very highly. They were very competitive last year. So I think Norwood's probably the, the up and coming. OK, uh, this year I think we might play Baldwin in the grand final with their inclusions from Scoresby. They're going to be very tough again this year. My biggest threat for the grand final this year in Divi 2 would be uh, Montrose, Montrose or Moorabark. Well, obviously I reckon we'll be uh, playing against Montrose in the grand final. Montrose have been a form side for the last couple of years and uh, they keep recruiting. They've got a bucket load of money coming in up there and uh, they're just dying to get in the first division. So uh, definitely the form side and uh, everyone's tipping them, so they'll be the side to beat. My old sparring partner, Chris Barlow's side, uh, Vermont, uh, they've picked up some really high quality players as well and uh, 
I expect to be playing them in the grand final and nothing better than beating them in the grand final. Actually, John? It's hard for me to know, having uh, not seen a lot of Division Two footy, but Montrose and Murrubuck have been right up the top for a couple of years, so I expect them to be OK. And for me, I think with the playing list being so even across the board, it just comes down to who the best coach will be. So obviously, Lilydale, Simon Rourke should, uh, should take it from there. Great to hear from some of the Division 1 and Division 2 coaches of the Eastern Football League about who their side might play in the grand final later on in the year. But our attention turns to this weekend now, Frosty, and particularly to the Vermont Football Club. A massive day planned on Saturday, their 1,000th game in the AFL, the first club in the league to reach that milestone. A huge uh, preparation from months ago. This has been uh, building up. And Damien Watson went out to the Vermont Football Club to find out just what it means to be reaching 1,000 games this weekend. Well, the Vermont Football Club run out for the 1,000th time in the Eastern Football League and joining the throng for the Eagles is star Tom Schneider. Tom, thanks for joining us on EFL TV. No worries, good to be here. Now, you've come over from the Box Hill Hawks, obviously, winning a best and fairest over there last season. How have you adapted to the club environment? Um, oh, it's a great club down in Vermont. Every Everyone knows that, obviously, and, um, you know, obviously it's not an ideal start 0-2 going into the season, but we're looking forward to obviously bounce back in our 1,000th game for the club this weekend. And speaking of the 1,000th game, there's a significant aura of history around the club. Have you noticed that in your first few months here? Oh, definitely, especially even, you know, players playing in the club still. Obviously, Ryan Mullet, Froudy, obviously, Bardo, a couple of great players that have had, you know, massive few, you know, histories with the club, and you know, I'm really looking forward to this weekend. Now, two losses from two starts, not the most ideal start for the club, but you'd be eager to reparate for your season so far against Norwood on Saturday. Yeah, definitely, and obviously Norwood have showed a bit there, 2-0. Um, they've started the season really well, and we've got a lot of new footballers down in the club this year, um, you know, a lot playing one, so it's taken a little while to obviously adapt to our game style as quick as we want, but we're getting there and, you know, obviously hoping, looking forward to a good win this weekend. And best on ground last week, as well as Ash Froud, the uh, recruit from Sylvan, booting five goals. It seems as if the new arrivals have adapted well to the club on the field as well as off it. Yeah, well, um, you know, it was nice to obviously get a little bit of the footy this weekend. It was a pretty disappointing game personally last week. But, um, you know, Froud is obviously a great footballer and showed a fair bit on the weekend. And kicking five goals obviously shows how good a footballer he is. Now just tell us about the coach Chris Barlow, your first encounter with him. Is he a driven man? Um, it is my first encounter with him. I actually played... A bit of uh, footy with him when I was a young fellow when he uh, was at Blackburn. So, um, you know, he's a great bloke and he was obviously a massive reason I came to the football club. And, um, you know, he's a great coach. He's a really driven coach um, and obviously extremely competitive and wants a great result from the boys this weekend. And what do you feel is the best aspect of the club, you know, since you've been here? Um, oh, you know, probably just everything, the professionalism um, around the place. Um, you know, there's a great... There's a great feel, I reckon, this year. The boys are really confident, um, you know, going into the season. You know, it wasn't obviously an ideal start, like I said, but, um, you know, we've still got plenty of confidence going into this week and just, yeah, the professionalism around the club. And the grand final loss last year, obviously you weren't a part of that, but has that been a significant motivational factor for the boys? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, you know, we would have liked to got the four points last weekend against Baldwin, yep. but, um, you know, they've shown a fair bit this year already. Um, you know, they're a great side and... You know, I think the boys are really looking forward to yeah, resurrect what we did last year. And Norwood, what do you know about them obviously being an outsider, I suppose you could call it. Uh, they're a credible side. They were minor premiers last year. Yeah. They'll obviously be an intimidating opponent on the weekend. Yeah, definitely. Um, obviously don't know that much about them. As of yet, we're sort of still covering a little bit of the balling game and what we can improve on. But um, you know, I'll learn a fair bit more about them on Thursday and the way they like to move the ball and you know, how we're going to beat them. How would you summarise the standard of football in Division 1 Eastern Football League, the atmosphere around it? How have you found it? Um, you know, it's been great. Um, you know, we've had past players day this weekend, which is going to be good. Um, but obviously playing down at Scoresby against Roval round one, you know, Roval really got up and about and their crowd was huge, which probably lifted them in that second half. So, you know, I think if we can get the crowd behind us this weekend at our home deck, um, I think it's going to go a long way in helping us. And did you enjoy congreg congregating with the past players? Obviously, 19 flags to the club's name. It's yeah. such a rich, rich history, isn't it? Oh, definitely. Um, I know a few of the ex-players as well. The Cullens, I'm pretty close family friends with, and Nummy and a few of the players. And, you know, they're obviously great footballers and they show a fair bit off-field as well. So I'm um, just looking to obviously try to be one of those players and, you know, make my own history at the club. Well, good luck for the weekend, Tom, and uh, we wish you well. No worries. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> Great work there from Damien Watson out there at Vermont Recreation Reserve 
during the week. Frosty, what, imagine the pressure, I think, on the field for Vermont to perform this weekend. They come up against Norwood, who are in scintillating form at the moment. They've been very impressive across the two weeks. It's going to be a fantastic day. I think, I think more importantly, a, a magnificent occasion, I think, for the club. It's a real celebration day for the Vermont Football Club. They've played all their 1,000 games after this Saturday in Division 1. The only club in the competition to have done that. Absolutely a great day for them to celebrate and really showcase how really they're a powerhouse of local football and they're going to put all that on display on the weekend. A really great game for them as well, coming up against the Norwood side who are probably set to challenge this year under Dennis Knight. They've changed their game style, so this is going to be a ripping contest and I can't wait to see what the score's going to be coming out of that game. Now, Frosty, you might have remembered an award last year called the Wingman Award, and it was a statewide competition, and someone from our league, a club in our league, was able to win the award. It was John Parks from the Park Orchards Football Club. He was rewarded for uh, encouraging good behaviour and good uh, serving of alcohol, responsible serving of alcohol, and he was featured on the footy show last Thursday night. This footage, all thanks to Channel 9. Uh, what did you do to win the award last year, Johnny? Yeah, down at our club, we had a bit of uh, alcohol-fueled rowdiness in a small section of our uh, local crowd in a dry area, which um, you know, can be pretty detrimental to the club, lose your liquor licence. So um, I was involved in a kind of a, a team. We put forward a, a, plan. Pure, yeah, a plan and we, um, to get back the uh, kind of the family-friendly environment that we uh, strive to keep and it ended up, yeah, we came through with the goods. So you actually moved those guys from drinking one area to another area and solved the problem. Fantastic. Yeah, we kind of, in a positive way, we kept them as, as uh, positive supporters and didn't kind of, uh, you know... Cause too much yeah, trouble. chop them off. <laughs> Frosty, time for our favourite part of EFL TV. The EFL TV Play of the Week kicked off last week and we had a great response on the EFL poll. And the winner in the end was Dean Sear Coolis from the Mulgrave Football Club for this play. 10 metres out from goal. It was a big knock away that time by Leolios. He got it away towards Sear Coolis who bags it on his boot. You can't believe it. He has somehow plucked this one out from nowhere. Great work there from Dean. Uh, he likes himself a lot, Dean, from what we understand. So uh, great to see. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll be showing that to the boys right throughout the season. Now, it's time to have a look at this week's nominations. Four nominations this week, A, B, C, and D. Check these out. It's everywhere, just wax it on the left. Not a bad kick. 70 out from the East Line. Got a great mark taken there away. Broke the tackle, did O'Keefe. Can have a shot on goal, and it's just the... No, it's a goal. Oh, what a great goal. goal. Four great plays there, Frosty, from James O'Keefe from the Eastern Lions, of course, from David Johnson from Norwood, Dylan Heath from Doncaster East, and Grattan Stevens from South Croydon. It's got, got off to a good start, the EFL TV play of the year, but I think we might have an early runner looking at uh, David Johnson's mark, uh, mark B, play B in this week's episode. I really like the solo effort from James O'Keefe from the Eastern Lions. I thought that was a fantastic goal, but how do you go past that, that absolute hanger from David Johnson? He seems to take one of these every year. We saw one feature on EFL Mark of the Year last year. Another one, we've got one in round two, an early contender. That's almost all we've got time for on EFL TV, Peter, but we have one more segment that we want to introduce. You and I and plenty of the media team guys, and I'm sure plenty of people out there in EFL TV land, see plenty of footy over the course of a season. Plenty of unique characters come across, but I think more importantly, unique hairstyles is something that features quite prominently. So we're on a search here on EFL TV to find the best haircut in the Eastern Football League. And we started on the weekend by having a look and you noticed an absolute pearler. I did. I said I've seen lots of haircuts going around on a footy field, but I very rarely see an afro like this one. Check this one out. 
This belongs to Chris Durow from the Eastern Lions. It's one of the best haircuts I've seen in local footy. And he's our nomination from round two for the search for the best haircut in the Eastern Football League. It's uh, nice and fluffy. Must have done something extra special before he ran out for the Eastern Lions reserves on the weekend. Now, you can get involved by sending in your uh, best haircut or the person you think has the best haircut in the league. Send your nomination to competitions at efl.org.au. Competitions at efl.org.au. And we'll endeavour to feed Feature it on EFL TV. Frosty, a massive weekend, uh, a massive day on Thursday, obviously, with four big games on Anzac Day and a massive weekend of EFL footy. It's been EFL TV again. Uh, looking forward to seeing you uh, next week. Oh, absolutely, mate. Can't wait. That's us done for another week. So you better call me a cab. You're a cab. See you next week. <laughs>